I want to thank uh, your pastor and the board of elders and the church board for the invitation for my wife and myself to be here. We, it's, it's a joy uh, every time we have the opportunity to come back to Nairobi. We feel that we are part of the Nairobi people, of the Kenyan people, amen? And we're just, it's just a joy to be here. Um, so we'll be here for the rest of the week, and I'll take the time. I won't take the time now to do the greetings because I'm running against the clock. So, uh, but we'll be here for the rest of uh, of this week, and um, want to make sure you're back out this afternoon uh, for our uh, uh, second presentation, which will be entitled "Blunders on the Borders." So, whatever you do, don't miss this afternoon. Right? It's blunders. On the borders. That's this afternoon uh, for our final presentation. Um, but allow me, therefore, just to share a few things with you before we get into the message today. I was, Pastor, I was particularly happy with the theme that was chosen for your camp meeting. What's the theme? Jesus is coming, what? Get involved. And one of the reasons I'm so happy about it, because I'm consumed with the theme of Jesus is coming. I believe that for, to a large extent, many in our church have abandoned that theme. And it is that which makes us a church. We are called to prepare the world for that event the second coming of Christ. And every single member of this church must have that theme well, well understood, well believed, and ready to participate in it. And by the way, I would like to say something more. This, this second coming of Christ is not just for the Adventist church. It's for every single Christian believer in Kenya and in the planet. And so what we will be sharing today is, and I'm happy for folks who are watching by, at home at, on television or by YouTube or wherever you're watching. And for those of you who will be watching a little bit later, this presentation is designed for you today. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to put aside preaching for a couple of minutes uh, or even for this morning. I'm going to ask your permission to put aside preaching for this morning because I want to take the time out and deal with a subject that is central to the second coming of Christ. I want to make sure that all of us understand this subject matter very well. Is that all right? Is that okay? Good, good. So we're going to do some work together. The, the worship service is over. Now we're going to do some work together. So bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, this is your church. This is your message and I now ask that you will remove the preacher and speak to your people all by yourself in Jesus name we pray amen so I'm gonna put a text on the screen when we talk about the second coming of Christ it is very clear that we, we get this set and put away right up front Nobody knows the exact day or the time when Christ is coming. Yes, the text says, but of that day and hour no man knows, not even, help me read, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So whatever we say, no, read the preacher's lips, nobody knows the exact day or time when Christ is coming. If we knew it, then we would not need prophecy. Does that make sense? Yes, if we already know, we don't need prophecy, right? If we already know the day. And it is because God has not given us the day why he provides us the second best thing, and that is prophecy to tell us just how, how close that coming is and what we can know. So, the, you know, everybody seeks to get more information on this subject. The, the apostles or the disciples after the resurrection of Christ and just before he departed they asked Jesus this question they said Lord will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel and and he said to them it is not for you help me read it is not for you to know the 
times or the seasons which the Father has put in his authority. What God has not disclosed to you is not for you to know. But what he has disclosed, everybody in the church needs to know that. So what has he disclosed about the second coming of Christ? That is what we're going to dive into right now. And to do that, we're heading for the book of... We're heading for the book of Daniel. One of the most beautiful books of Daniel. In, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you. I have found, I've searched the Bible from Revelation back to Genesis and Genesis to Revelation. I found only one text in the Bible that actually identifies the time period when Christ is coming. One text. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the text. Only one I've found. If you find another one, let me know. Here's it. It's in, it's in, it's in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Here's the text. It says, And, help me read. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will do what? Set up a kingdom. I want to highlight a word, word for you. In when? When will God set up his kingdom? In the days of these kings. Everybody should be finding out who are these kings and what days that will be because Daniel says that God will set up his kingdom in the days of these kings. Um, and, and here's what the text says. And this kingdom shall not be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And here's it coming. And it shall stand and it shall stand forever. So we now know that God's kingdom that will stand forever, he's going to set it up in the period, in the days of these kings. And your question is, who are these kings? And that's what we're going to go um, searching for. Verse 45 of that text, of that chapter says, Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great, help me read in red, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass when? After this. So for the next 45 minutes that the clock on the wall gave to me, we're going to use to excavate the word of God to find out how close he is to the second coming. So, on the screen is a map of the kingdom of Israel. By the time Daniel was born, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two, king, two kingdoms, kingdom of Israel and kingdom of Judah. In the green, the kingdom of Israel was already consumed by, by the Assyrians, so that kingdom no longer exists. The only kingdom that remained is the kingdom of Judah. Judah is where Jerusalem and young Daniel was in the kingdom of Judah. It was about 605 BC when our good friend down in Babylon by the name of Nebuchadnezzar got his army and marched from all the way from Babylon up in all the way from Iraq where Babylon is located all the way up to Jerusalem, conquered the city of Jerusalem and burned it down and captured, as some of you know the story, captured the strong men from Jerusalem and took them back down as prisoners of war into Babylon. Among one of those groups is our friend Daniel along with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Good. So they were back down in Jerusalem as prisoners of war. And the Bible tells us that no, long, no sooner had he reached Jerusalem that he was placed in the university, I mean reach uh, Babylon, that Daniel was placed in the university down in Babylon and was taught and we learned in chapter 1 of Daniel that he was the top of his class, graduated with a 4.0 GPO, GPA in the Babylonian University, one of the wisest guys, listen to the preacher, one of the wisest guys in Babylon. Did you get that? Yes, 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 yes. One of the wisest guys in Babylon. So therefore, when we are ready for wise men in Babylon, Daniel will be among them. Is the church with me? Yes, in the church of me. So, so, so now, I want, here's where the story begins about the second coming of Christ in the book of Daniel. It's a nice little story before we get to the prophecy. So I'm going to speed up the story so I can get to the prophecy. The story is in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, verse 1. 
Bible says, now in the second year of the Nebuchadnezzar's reign. That's a date stamp. Anytime the Bible gives you a date stamp, the time and date, it's for, for a reason. Second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Meaning that he had a dream, woke up in the morning like some of you, and knew he had a dream but can't remember what he dreamt. Good. Um, then, and so the Bible says he, he called all his advisors together, called them in the situation room, had an emergency meeting, or the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. Most of you know the, who magicians are and astrologers and sorcerers. You may not know who the Chaldeans are. Who are the Chaldeans? Well, these are the educated, formally educated guys. These are the university professors. Okay? Yes. Yes, these are, these are the formal, they, they, speak, they speak proper. The sorcerers and magicians, you all know them, but these guys are the educated ones. So they bring, they, they bring them together in the, in, the, in, the, in the room to advise the king. And so to tell the king the dream, the, the king brought them. I said, since you guys are wise people and wise men, you are well educated and you are, you know, you're good in your sciences, I want you to tell me what I dreamt last night. And I want you to tell me the interpretation. Ooh. Ah, big, big stuff. <laughs> so they came and they stood before the king. I'm in verse 3 of Daniel 2. I'm in verse 3 of Daniel 2. And the Bible says, the king said to them, I had a dream last night and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Verse 4. And so the Chaldeans, who are they again? The educated one, the university professors. They are, they are the spokesperson for the group. Is church with me? So they said to the king, and they spoke in Aramaic, they said, O king, live forever. Um, we don't have a problem telling you, your, you know, telling you the interpretation, but we want you to tell us what your dream is so that we can supply the interpretation. That's the problem. We want you to tell us what you dreamt so that we can give you the interpretation. So people who go to science men and obia people and you guys have obia people around your head what do you have here scientists no, no palm readers and those people what do you call them you don't have them around here huh you're all silent you all don't you have no people those what do you call the people who read your palm and deal with devil spirits and all those people bush doctors witch doctors okay good so, <laughs> um, so, 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 when you go to the witch doctor, that's what you have to do. You have to provide him with information, and then he tell you what's going on. That's what they tried to do with the king. He said, "You tell us the dream, and we will supply the interpretation." Okay, um, and we'll, um, verse five. Then the king answered and said, "I can't tell you the dream. Why? The thing is gone from me. I don't know what I dreamt. I want you to tell me what I dreamt." Last night, right? And if you don't tell me, and if you can't provide me what I dream and the interpretation, then, then I will cut you in pieces. Woo. And your houses, I'll bulldoze it down and get rid of you. Um, however, if you tell me the dream and interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, the king says, tell me the dream and give me the interpretation. Verse 11, um, the, the guy says, Lord, uh, says, King, it's a difficult thing that you're asking because there is nobody who ever asked this of any wise man who can tell the king except the gods who dwell who is not dwelling among flesh. What you're asking for us, only the gods can help you. In other words, it's a bigger sign. Verse 12, for this reason the king got very angry, uh -huh, furious, and he gave a command. Here's it. He gave a royal order to destroy all wise men. By the way, who was the wisest guy in town? Daniel. Woo! So now there's an order to kill all wise men, and on the top of the list is Daniel. Ah, here's the Bible says. So, so, so here's it. So the decree went out, I mean, verse 13, and they began kill. Notice what the text says. They began, read with me, and they began killing. That's what the text says. So some were already dead by the time they reached to Daniel. Okay? They began killing. And, and so they knock up Daniel's. 
when Daniel opened the door, there was Ariak out there with his sword well drawn, with a royal command to kill all wise men, and you are on the kill list. Why? Because you have a 4.0 GPA. That's why if, you're, if your GPA is not too well, say, praise the Lord. <laughs> they saw, so, so they sought Daniel and his companion to kill him. And Daniel went in and, and said, so Daniel said, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't kill anybody else. Just take me to the king. Let me talk to the king. So Daniel, so the, Daniel went in and asked the king to give him what? time he went to the king said king give me a little time that i may tell the king the interpretation i mean verse 17 daniel went to his house after the king we don't know how much time the king gave him the king gave him a little time put a stay of execution in place and gave him a little time he rushed home and at home he gathered the three bodies that he had shadrach meshach and abednego it's good to have good praying partners amen because when you're in trouble you need somebody to pray with Hello, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so you got Ananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, his companions, and they went down on their knees, and that they, they prayed to God that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret which the king had. Uh, verse 19, they prayed and they went to bed. In the morning, the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. Can the church say amen? amen. Yeah, in other words, get, get, get this, get this, get this, get this. Get this, the king had the dream. It is not the king who had the dream, really. It is God who gave the king the dream. Is the church with me? But after God gave the king the dream, God pressed the delete button. So when he woke up in the morning, it was gone. Then God transferred the dream and downloaded it into Daniel's head and pressed the save button. So in the morning, the dream was there. So the Bible says the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He re and Daniel says, God of heaven reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. Therefore, I mean, verse 24, therefore Daniel went to Ariak, who is a soldier killing everybody, and said to, to thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I will tell the king the interpretation because he now had the stuff is the church with me yeah so he went to the king king answered and said to him to daniel are you able to make known to me the dream and the interpretation do you have the stuff amen do you have the stuff amen and daniel answered in the presence of the king and said king the see help me read the secret which you are demanding these wise men and these astrologers and these magicians and these soothsayers, these bush doctors cannot declare it before the king. This is higher science. But it says, but there is a God in heaven who does what? Reveal secret and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be when? In the latter days. So the dream, help me, help, help me preach. The dream that you have is God gave it to you, but it is about the latter days. It's not about your time. It's about the latter days. It's about 2023 in Nairobi. That's why it is relevant today. Right? He says it's about the latter days. Then Daniel says, your dream and vision of your head upon your bed were these. And then Daniel went and told the king what was in his mind. This is my favorite part of the text. Watch this, watch this, don't miss this, don't miss. Daniel says, don't miss this, don't miss this. All eyes on me, all eyes on me, all eyes on me. Daniel says, I am going to tell you what you were thinking before you started sleeping last night. Did you get that? Daniel says, as for you, O king, thoughts, what? Thoughts came to your mind while you were in bed. Come stay with me. Thoughts came to your mind while you were in bed. Thoughts about what? Answer about what would come to pass after this. So, so, uh, so here's what Daniel, Daniel says. When you bed, went to bed last night, you lay down there and you could not sleep. And you were thinking, what's going to happen down the road in life? 
you were thinking, is this kingdom going to be destroyed? Am I going to live forever? How he, Your mind went to the future like some of you. Am I going to be married? Am I going to get a rich man? My children will grow up. You're, you're thinking, you are thinking about the future. And Daniel says, and because you were thinking about the future, wondering what will happen to the kingdom of Babylon, God decided to remove the curtain and show you what's going to happen in the future. Is the church with me? Yes. And then he says, he who reveals secret has made known to you what will be. And then he says, here is what you dreamt last night. Oh, holy moly. And the room get quiet because nobody could ever possible entertain the idea that somebody can tell you what you dreamt last night. So the king was speechless and breathless and he wanted to hear. I mean, verse 31 of chapter 2, Daniel, Daniel says, You, O king, you are watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, and its chest and arms of silver, and its belly and thigh of bronze. Daniel says, its legs were made of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of Clay, are you still with me? Are you still with me? Balcony, you're still with me? Good, good, good. Daniel says, verse 34. Daniel says, You watched while a stone, a what? A stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its, which struck the image on its, one more time, which struck the image on its, on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. So somebody put together a little sketch of what that may look like. I want you to take note that this image is in the form of a human being. Yes? It's not in the form of a fish or a bird or a cow or an insect. It's in the form of a human being. Why? Because what you will see is that this image represents the existence of humankind from the time of Daniel's dream to the day when the Lord puts in his experience. It's how much time man has left back on planet Earth. Is the church with me? Good. So here's Daniel. You watch while a stone, I highlight that for you, cut out without hand, which struck the image on its feet. I highlight that for you. Keep in mind, I'm coming back for those two things. Verse 35. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver, when the stone hit the image, the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold, yeah, they were, notice, the iron and the clay from the feet, right, all the way back up, they were, they were, they, uh, they were crushed together and became like a chaff of the summer threshing floor. They become pieces and the wind carried them away. <laughs> uh, carried them away so that no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. That's Daniel's dream. That's Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And that's the dream God gave Nebuchadnezzar, took it back out of his head and gave it to Daniel. And Daniel recorded for people in Nairobi 2023. Now, if you're sleeping, wake up. Because I'm going to give you a little video graphic of what the dream looked like, which you just read a while ago. So let's see if we can roll this. This is, this is, what, they got, this is what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Okay, take a good look. He's dreaming. Saw a huge image. Head was of gold chest of silver its belly and thigh were made of brass its legs of pure iron and then the feet were mixed with iron and clay then he said he saw a stone what's that stone coming cut out without hand coming down and coming down for the image and bam crash into the image and the image is no more 
and the stone which struck the image turned into a great mountain. Now you understand why this guy must get an, in, an interpretation for this dream. Is the church still with me? Yeah. This is this dream. This dream, every member in this church needs to understand this and know it well because this is the clearest indication of the second coming of Christ. So we're going to roll it. We're going to roll this for you again. And I want you to... I want you to notice where, where the stone hit the image. Take a good look at it. I want you to notice where the stone hit the image. Now we are the, we're, we're, we're down to the clay. Here's a stone coming. Here's a stone coming. Here's a stone coming. And I want coming towards that image. Coming towards that image. And that's, have you noticed where it hit the image? Yes. Let me see if I can find it for you. Okay. Here's the stone. Here's the stone. Here's the, notice where it hit the image. Where does it hit the image? Yeah. You see that? Not in the head. Not in the belly. Not in the thigh. Not even in the leg. It hit the image where? In the feet. Verse 36, that's the dream, Daniel says. Now we will tell you the interpretation before the king. Notice Daniel said, we. <laughs> we, we, we will, we will supply. The it's only him alone, you know, but it's we, because he's with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We will tell you what the dream means, Okay. Here's the interpretation. Fasten your seatbelt. He says, you okay. What in the world does this dream mean? Here's it coming. Here's it coming. And what's the relevance for Kenya? What's the relevance for Nairobi? What's the relevance for Nairobi Central? What's the relevance for all of you watching television right now? Whether you go to Adventist Church or, or, or Church of God or Pentecost, whatever church you go to, this dream is for you. What is relevance? Here's it. You O king. This is the interpretation. You are the king of kings, for God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You represent what? You represent the head of gold. You, Babylon, represent the head of gold. At that time, Babylon kingdom was from 605 BC and lasted to 539 BC. That period of time in human history represent the head of gold, right? Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom represent the head of gold. So now you'll realize all of these different metals represent a kingdom. There are four different metals, which mean there are four kingdoms. Is the church with me? And then the stone, which also is another kingdom. So it's five kingdoms in all. Hang on. This is a geopolitical piece of prophecy that you have to stay with me on. So, I put on the map what the Babylonian territory looked like. That's in red. That's what they had at the time. Just a little piece there, uh, including the Palestinian lands and part of Iraq and Iran. Okay. Then Daniel says, But after you, after the head, after you shall rise another kingdom which is inferior to yours, just as gold, silver is inferior to gold. Um, uh, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Notice John, Daniel says there's be another kingdom. Now, notice for me, these kingdoms are kingdoms that rule the entire world. The entire world is under the rulership of these kingdoms. Is the church with me? Yes, good. So Daniel said there'll be another and a third kingdom. They shall rule over the entire world. The second kingdom that came after Nebuchadnezzar was the kingdom of the Medes and the... Persians. Yes, Babylon was destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. 538 BC, the great Babylon kingdom was destroyed. And how did they destroy Babylon? Ah, Babylon had one weakness in it, and that was the river, river Euphrates that runs through the, the city of Babylon. And so what the Medes and Persians did was to go upstream, divert the water. The, the riverbed was low, and so the soldiers climbed underneath there, went into Babylon, destroyed Babylon. Right? Uh, there's some information there I'll, I'll give you a little bit later. But some of you read this in, in, in the book of Babylon where that night um, Belshazzar was having a banquet. You remember that stuff? Yeah, and while he was laughing and drinking, there's a hand 
appeared from nowhere out of the sleeve of darkness and started writing on the wall and that brought the end of the Babylonian kingdom and the kingdom that defeated them were the Medes and the Persians. We now move from gold to, we move from gold to silver. Yeah, Medes and Persians. And they extended their kingdom a little bit more. Stay with me because I'm going somewhere. I'm going to end up in Nairobi. Stay with me. The third kingdom, Daniel said there'll be a third kingdom because no kingdom lasts forever, only God's kingdom. Am I right? So there's a third kingdom. That third kingdom is the kingdom of Greece, represented by the brass, the belly and thigh. And um, Greece conquered Medes and Persia in 331, and it ruled until 168 AD. Greece was led by the good Alexander the Great, and so they conquered the world, um, and they extended their territory a little up in, east, in the eastern direction. And then Daniel says, after Greece, there will be a fourth kingdom, Stay with the preacher. And then Daniel said, This kingdom shall, let me read, shall be what? Strong as iron, inasmuch as iron break in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, this, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all other kingdoms. This is the kingdom of Rome, the iron monarchy of Rome. Rome conquered Alexander the Great in 168 BC. And now Rome was ruling. Rome ruled the entire world from 168 BC over into 351 AD, which means that when Christ came, Rome, Rome was in power. And you remember, it is Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus. You remember that? Yes, yes. So it was. The, so when Christ came the first time, we are now in the legs of iron. Is the church with me? Yes, let me say that one more time. When Christ came the first time, we have now moved down to the legs of iron and clay. That's the period. And Rome extended their territory on the map. Then I'm interested in the feet. The text says, verse 41, I mean, Daniel chapter 2, 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, notice what the text says. The kingdom shall be divided. Notice the text. The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. Verse 42. And the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So, hey, 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 everybody with me now. We move from head, Babylon. Move to chess, Media Persia. Move from Media Persia to Greece. Move from Greece to Rome. Now, 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 now. After Rome, which is the legs, the only thing left back on the image is what? The feet. So who are these feet? Well, notice the feet is divided into ten toes. Am I correct? Yes, 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 yes. So what happened to Rome? No kingdom conquered Rome. None. So what happened to Rome? Rome implode. Rome, Rome destroy itself from within, in fighting. And then the kingdom of Rome was split into ten tribes, represented by the ten toes. Is the church with me? Yes, represented by the ten toes. Daniel says, those toes, some of them will be strong, and some will be fragile, which means ten different countries came out of Rome, some of them strong, some of them weak. The kingdom shall be divided, partly strong, partly weak. These nations become what we now call the nations of Europe. Is the church with me? Yes, 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 yes. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's where we get the, they now are the nations that form themselves into the European Union. And if you know anything about the European Union, these countries want to be united like the United States of America. And so their mission is to get themselves united. But Daniel says they will have a problem because some of them are strong and some of them are weak. And that's not going to hold together. Uh -huh, hang on, hang on, hang on. So these are the names of the old names, uh, of the, the old time names of these 10 countries, the Franks and the Visigoths and the Burgundies and the ULIs. These are old-time names. So I give you some old-time names and the new names. The Alemanni is the German, the Franks is the France, Anglo-Saxon is the English, Burgundians is Switzerland. These are the ten toes 
Three of them were destroyed um, when the papacy was coming to power, leaving seven. Is the church still with me? Yeah, I'm going somewhere, I'm going somewhere. So I put on, I put on, the, on the map for you an idea of the old um, map of Rome, the kingdom of Rome, which now become the U European Union. Now what's this all about, preacher? Well, here's the text. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed, they who? The ten toes, is the church with me? Yes, the ten kingdoms that form out of Europe, they will mingle with the seed of men. What does that mean? That word seed in Greek is spermatos, from which we get the word sperm, meaning children. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere, they will not stick together, they will not hold together, they will try to be united, but they will not, come on, preach with me, they will not adhere, they will not stick together, they will try to come together, but the pack will not hold, is the church with me? Yeah, 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 because some are strong and some are weak. Some don't want to give up their currency and some want strong currency. So they will not hold together. They, but they will try to unite themselves through the mingling of the seed. What does that mean? That means intermarriage. Ah. So I stumbled upon this paragraph. And then if you know the history of Europe, you will know. One of the ways that Europe trend, trend to keep itself together is that they marry one prince from one kingdom to the princess of another kingdom. Is the church with me? And they intermarried among themselves to form alliance. And Daniel saw that years ago, and Daniel says not even that will work because they will not stick together. And so Europe, the European Union, has been trying to defy prophecy. They try to get an EU passport to unite themselves together. They have an EU currency the euro to unite themselves together. They have an EU court of, of human rights to unite themselves together. They have an EU army called NATO. There are two other countries involved in it, US and Canada. And they have a EU, EU commission and an EU parliament and they're doing everything to unite themselves together. And Daniel says it will not happen. No matter what they do, it will not happen because iron and clay do not mix. Well. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will, not, they will mingle with the seed of men. Here's it coming. But they will not stick together. They will try, and for a while it looks as if they will be united, but something will happen. They will not hold together. Oh, something did happen. As soon, as soon as Europe settled down and thought, okay, we're united for first of all, then all out of a sudden, Ah, on June 23rd, 2016, the English folks decide we want to get out because we're the strongest economy in this EU and we're not giving up our sovereignty. And we're not giving up our rights. And so they voted on a referendum to get out of the EU. Hey, Daniel, prophecy is taking effect. Is the church with me? And by January 31st, 2020, it became official England pull out, Britain pull out of the EU called Brexit. Brexit was a big shocker. Nobody expected it to happen. Even the Queen backed Brexit. And that was a big surprise. Uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister at the time, begged the people, don't do that. But the Bible says they will not adhere together, not one together. Brethren, let me talk to you. When the Bible gives you prophecy, there's nothing on planet Earth can change prophecy. Daniel says they will not hold together. And that day, when Brexit occurred, the stock market around the world lost $2.3 trillion. It was an earth-shaking movement. The prophecies of Daniel was fulfilled. Well, that's, that's for the politicians. For us in church, and for you in Nairobi, and for those of you watching via the internet, and those of you watching all parts of the world, here's where I want to take your focus. Keep your eyes on the feet. Keep your eyes on the feet. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands, Daniel says. Struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. 
So the question for us in church this morning, when is that stone arriving? Answer, answer. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Now I can ask you, which kings? The kings of the ten toes. The kings of the European nation. Watch a preacher, watch a preacher, watch a preacher. Watch. While the nations of Europe are still existing, God will put in his appearance. Put another way, there will not be another kingdom that rule the entire world. No matter how big, bad China think it is, there will be no world power. The last world power was Rome. Watch the preacher. There will be no more world power. The next world power that will rule is God's kingdom. God says, in the days of these fragmented infighting toes of the nation of Europe, the God of heaven will put in his kingdom. Is the church with me? Four kingdoms already gone, one is left, and that the last one is a stone. That's God's kingdom. That's God's kingdom. And the Bible says, it, and, and which shall never be destroyed, and it shall stand for how long? Forever. Now, question, when was Europe formed? Well, the European Union was formed in November 1, 1993. That's when they start coming together, as Daniel prophesied. The founders, look at the founders, still part of the little group, as Daniel prophesied. As that prophesied. I'm going to run. I'm going to run this dream for you one more time. I'm going to run this dream for you one more time. And before I run this dream, I want to ask this question. Today, 2023, are we living in the head? Huh? Are you sure? Yes, we're not in the head. Why? The head was way back in Nebuchadnezzar's days. Am I right? Are we living in the chest? No, that was way back in the days of the Medes and Persians. Are we living in the belly and the thigh? No, that was way back in the days of Alexander. Are we living in the legs? No, that was way back in the days of Rome. So where are we living? Somebody says, not even, somebody said, one day I was at our church preaching, and so I asked the question, somebody said, Pastor, we're not even living in the toes. We're in the toenail. <laughs> so, so watch me. If, if you sit in church today, if you realize that on that image, we are living in the feet, in the toes, it means that after the toes, there's no more time left. The image ends there. Is the church with me? Because it's a history of human life. So after this, there's no more time left. The only thing left back out of this dream is what? The stone. Because we have already, hey, 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 we have already lived out the image. Oh, you see, look at it. We have already lived out the image. We have already lived, human beings have lived out the image. We have lived out the image. We have completed the whole thing. And you were born at the very edge of the image, at the stone. So the only thing Nairobi should be looking for is a stone to roll in at any moment now. Any moment now. And if the stone, hey, 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 watch me. And if the stone represents the coming kingdom of God, I want you to notice where the stone hit the image. And if you tell me it hit the image on the feet and that's where you're living, then I'm going to tell you that the coming of God may strike while you are still alive. Let me roll it one more time. And then I close up for you and send you home. This is the image. This is the dream. This is the dream. On that image we are living, we're not in the head. That's a long time gone. We're not in the chest. Long time gone. We're not in the belly, brass of thigh. That's gone. We're not even in the legs. That's gone. Ah, but we're somewhere here. That's where you were born. That's where I was born. And that's where the stone is coming. Because that stone is going to connect the image, bam, right on the feet. That's where the stone is the image. Notice, heading. Heading, heading for this generation, heading for this generation. That's where the stone is, the image. That's where the stone 
it the image. If you're alive in the feet, it is in your time that the stone is coming. You don't have time. Oh, pastor, give me some time. Let me, I plan to get married first. No, the stone, let me finish education first. No, the stone is coming. The stone is coming. You're not living in the head, no. We're not living in the chest, no. We're not living in the belly, no. If you are living in those times, you don't need to come to church. You don't need to give your heart to the Lord. You can go have fun because ain't no stone coming. If you're living in the legs, you can enjoy yourself, party all night, ain't no stone coming. But if you're living in the feet, where we are living, then everybody in this generation should be looking up. Because any moment now, Daniel's stone will roll into Babylon. That's why I came here in Nairobi to share with you. That's the burden I carry as a preacher. That's the burden I carry as a preacher. When I passed through Nairobi, I went downtown yesterday and see thousands of people going about and don't have a clue that the stone is on its way. And that's why I want to challenge you as I close. If you have not yet given your heart to God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, let nothing, nobody stand in your way. This is the time to do it because the stone is coming. I want to pray for somebody as I close. I don't know who on the balcony. I don't know who on the bottom. You perhaps are in this congregation and you have not yet given your heart to the Lord. Maybe you have good reasons for not doing so. But have you having here this message, you want to say, Preacher, please pray for me. Please pray for me that I may make my calling and election sure. Please pray for me and my family that we can be saved before the storm. If that describes you, can I ask you just to raise your hand? I'll keep you in my purse. Is there anybody? Just raise your hand. God bless that hand. Is there another? Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? It says, Preacher, just pray for me by the grace of God. You're not yet giving your heart to the Lord. You want me to close as I close the prayer. Can I invite this congregation to stand with me? Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Can we stand together? Is there anybody else? I'm going to pray with you to close. I'm going to pray with you to close. I'm going to pray with you. Maybe you were a member of this church some time ago. Maybe you have gotten weak and step away from Christ. And you'd like to come back home. I'm going to pray to close. I'm going to invite you, if that describes you, walk with a friend. Come up front. Say, preacher, pray for me that when the Lord comes, it can be well with my soul. I'm going to invite you to do so as we sing.